I walked out of that trail the first time on those cold streets in Philadelphia, and I knew this was like the moment of truth. And they said, Sylvester, you ready? I said, no, but Rocky is. You're gonna eat like me, and you're gonna crack Why do you want to fight? Because I can't sing a dance. No, speed up! There was something about the process of unrealized dreams. I was always brought back to this subject because I think it's one of the most enduring subjects and one of the most difficult passages for people to accept that they never were realized in their own lifetime, that they just didn't get that shot. You know, I've been coming in for six years, and six years you've been sticking it to me. I want to know how come. You don't want to know. Yeah, I want to know how come. You want to know. I want to know. Okay, I'm going to tell you, because you had the talent to become a good fighter, and instead of that, you became a leg breaker to some cheap second-rate loan shark. To living? It's a waste of life. The more I thought about this kind of street-like character that just is totally mis represented by the way he looks physically. Just the way he walks down the street was enough to, to say people, oh, dismiss him. He kind of looks like a bully or looks like a dark kind of character. And don't hit the face! Shut up! Not the face! Mr. Gazzo wants the 200 now. Yeah? I'm broke. I don't think I have Mr. broke. Mr. Gazzo says I should get the 200 to break your thumb. You understand? Please. Huh? Please. No, I thought, you know, that's an interesting character because they're always unrealized. That festered in my mind for quite a while. And then one night, I went to see uh, Muhammad Ali fight Chuck Webner. We wanna be free! Chuck Webner! The world heavyweight boxing champion, Muhammad Ali! And what I saw was pretty extraordinary. I saw a man they called the Bayonne Bleeder who didn't have a chance at all against you know, the greatest fighting machine supposedly that ever lived. Downstairs, tries to get through with a left jab to the face. Good combination of punches. There's a good combination. Another three, four punches to the face of Wetner. But Wetner not visibly shaken as he continues to come in. This man does not back up. Don't underestimate the courage of Chuck Wetner. Don't underestimate the toughness of Chuck Wetner. For one brief moment, this supposed stumble bump turned out to be Magnificent in the fact that he lasted and knocked the champion down. I said, boy, if this isn't a metaphor for life, his entire life crystallized at that moment. He will be remembered for all eternity. He did something extraordinary. I said, now that, that is probably what I need as a catalyst an idea, a man who's going to stand up to life and take one shot and maybe go the distance. So I started to write. And it was one of those writing frenzies. And three days later, I came up with the script of Rocky. I first met Bob Shardoff and Erwin Winkler on a casting call. So we're talking a little bit, and I guess I really wasn't right for the acting part. And on the way out, I said, I don't know if it matters, but I do a little bit of writing. And he goes, really? I says, he says, yeah, I'm writing this, this story. I might do something about boxing. He goes, well, bring it around. And I thought, if I hadn't stopped on the way out, you know, that's why I tell all actors or writers, don't give up, keep talking. Eventually you might hit a nerve somewhere and they go, ah, come on back. If they didn't say, come on back, and let's see what you've developed, I wouldn't be sitting here. So I have to give incredible credit to their insight and their patience, and they're willing to take a chance. Originally, when I brought the script to them, 
they were fairly enthusiastic about it. The one thing they were not enthusiastic about was me playing the part. And I really can't blame them. At the time, Ryan O'Neill was a, a candidate, Burt Reynolds, Robert Redford, Jimmy Kahn, and they all you know, were, were at the top of their game. And so I could see it, but there was something inside of me, you know, this opportunity is never going to come around. And I really wasn't used to money, and I had no idea of what I would be missing. But the temptation started to come forward. First, it was twenty-five grand, then a hundred thousand dollars. I never heard of a hundred thousand because I had had like a hundred six dollars in the bank. Things were not looking very, very good. My forty-dollar car had just blown up, so I was taking a bus to work. And but still, it, it didn't matter. I wanted to stick with it. Then it went up to 150,000, 175,000, and it went up to 250,000. Now my head was starting to spin. And it went up to 330,000. And I thought, all right, you know, you've really managed poverty very well. You've got this down to a science. You really don't need much to live on. I know in the back of my mind, if I sell the script, and it does very, very well. I'm gonna jump off a building, and if I'm not in it. There's no doubt about it, I'm gonna leap in front of a train. I'm gonna be very, very upset. So this is one of those things where you just roll the dice and you fly by the proverbial seat of your pants and say, all right, I gotta try it. I gotta just do it. I may be totally wrong, and I'm gonna be taking a lot of people down with me, but I just, Believe in it. We didn't have really the, the money to shoot a normal union film at that time in Philadelphia, so we would travel in a van. I would jump out of the van, and uh, we were working with the handheld camera at the time with, with Garrett Brown, and it was uh, a somewhat experimental. And he'd film me running through shopping malls and up down the steps, curved corridors along the river until finally my legs basically gave out and I'm like writhing on the ground and I want to <laughs> rise up and say, John, I'm dying here. And he goes, no, no, use it. Use the pain. I said, for what? I mean, I'm in misery. He goes, well, no, no. You know, it's giving your character some depth. He would have me run and run and jump park benches and down streets and people are throwing things at me. Like when I had the orange thrown at me, and I'm, these people had no idea who I was. I was just some strange alien invader in a well-worn, tattered, baggy, <laughs> incredibly <laughs> ugly sweatsuit running through their neighborhood, you know? And they're like throwing things at me. And we kind of like made it work, but I actually was like, I thought they were trying to hit me with the orange. We just jumped down and saw this ship along the dock. Run as fast as you can along the ship. And I'm running and running. I said, you know what? My legs are buckling. I'm, I'm literally going to crash down here. Teeth are going to go, jaw, face. I'm just going to be ground down to this flat-faced image. And I just barely made it. Talia Shire was also a last minute choice because we, we just couldn't find the right person and then she came in and we just read and I felt the earth move. I, I really felt a tremendous vitality and kinship. I mean, I loved her. I really, really loved her. I just loved the way she looked and the way her hair fell and, and this timid, fragile creature. I said, just incredible and the perfect voice. Rocky meets her and he, he, he just talks to her and, and, and he sees a beauty in her that no one else sees. So, uh, I want to go home, make up a joke. I'm going to tell you a new joke tomorrow, okay? Good night, Adrian. Good night, Rocky. Everyone has something to do. Rocky really has nothing to do. So he moves at a much slower pace and he observes and he sees things that other people don't see. So he's trying to bring her out. I don't know, would you like to maybe, uh, you know, you want me to go out together? What do you think? Would you like to? Because... I guess he feels that she's probably the only one who's worse off than he is. We're gonna have a good time. So he's feeling kind of like a little protective towards her. I think we make a real sharp couple of coconuts. I'm dumb and you're shy. What do you think, huh? 
And I'm starting to like realize that this is the key to the film. This is the heartbeat. Hey, you want to come inside? No, I got to go. Well, I got to go too. I got to go to the bathroom. The whole movie is going to be based on the discovery of these two people, the love. <laughs> huh? Come on. Come on in. Yo, Adrian, you hungry? No. Hmm? She goes upstairs. I could go for some music. And now she's like terrified. This is not exactly what you call a swinging bachelor apartment. You want to sit down? Uh, these, these your parents? Yeah, that, that's both of them. Just you? Yeah, that's me when I was eight years old. That's the Italian style when he was a baby. The moment when he gets her to that door. Do me a favor. What? Take off these glasses. All of a sudden, the, the whole facade changes. He no longer looks like this terrifying guy. He goes, you know, you'll never see better responding by an actress to an awakening inside of like really feeling like someone truly loves her. It's like she's dying. She has never felt this before. And coming from this man who is, you know, this physical kind of specimen, the last kind of guy she ever imagined herself being with. I want to kiss you. You want to kiss me back if you don't want. I disappear in that scene. She is just off the chart. We go down to the floor. I, I don't know if I could ever have a scene that had more love than I'll ever do in it. Without a ranked contender, what this fight is going to need is a novelty. This is the land of opportunity, right? So Apollo Creed on January 1st gives a local underdog fighter an opportunity. And I couldn't have come up with a better Apollo Creed than, than Carl Weathers. He was absolutely magnificent on his feet. An amazing body, the perfect voice. Rocky, ain't you Italian? Yeah, I'm Italian. Well, now, what does that mean? That means if he can't fight, I bet he can cook. <laughs> We were going to use Ken Norton, and Ken Norton goes, well, no, I'm going to go to the ABC Superstar competition. It fell out like two nights before. I said, oh, boy. I tell you, I really believe in divine intervention sometimes because he walks in. He starts to audition, and he's doing the lines well. A snow-white underdog, and I'm going to put his face on this poster with me. And then he gets up, and he starts to box with me a little bit. <laughs> Bangs two or three off my head. I said, geez, this guy, he really doesn't care if he gets the part, does he? I mean, he's like he's putting lumps on my forehead and he's really into it. Well, yeah. All right, now here's the. Okay. Because I really want to go flying into these ropes. Right. Then he sits back down and he goes, uh, Mr. Avelson, I could do much better if you had a real actor reading with me. Well, Carl. That's Rocky, that's the guy who wrote the script. He goes, oh, maybe he'll get better. That's the way I see it. And that's the way it's gonna be. <laughs> you know what, I said, please hire him. Uh, he's, great. he's great. That's exactly the attitude I wanted. He was fantastic and he still is. Beat me, beat me. I love him, I love him. Oh, <laughs> Ain't gonna be no rematch. Ain't gonna be no rematch. The one one. The original ending of Rocky was uh, quite different than what we have now. The original ending was he, he goes the distance and he's looking for Adrian. The crowd is starting to disperse. Yes, he, he did a noble thing, but 
time moves on, the, the champion is carried out of the ring and Rocky starts to meander through the crowd. He eventually gets to the curtain. He pulls back the curtain at the back of the arena and sees Adrian. She gives him a, a slight hug and hand in hand, they start to walk back to the locker room. There's no one talking to him anymore. There's just trash strewn everywhere and they just see these two solitary figures moving off into the distance, off into like, you know, being anonymous forevermore. And it just didn't seem very, very satisfying. So we thought, boy, wouldn't it be interesting to catch a man's moment, a man's life at the quintessential seminal moment. So we went back. We only had the money to do like one quarter of the ring, so just a little corner. I have friends in the scene, I have producers in the scene. We had about 30 people, and you see these people going around in a circle, milling around, and, and crowds, and Rocky's going, oh, I, you know, just get everything out of my face. He's yelling for Adrian, Rocky, Adrian, Rocky. As Adrian is running, to the ring, again, very, very tight. They had uh, like fishing line connected to her hat and they pull her hat off. Because I thought, wouldn't it be interesting that the first thing Rocky says when she comes into the ring is like, where's your hat? I mean, he's so into her, into like the way she looks that he doesn't care that his eyes are swollen shut, his hands are smashed, and that he's done the greatest thing in his life. Rocky! Rocky! Hey, where's your hat? Right there, when I embrace her, we froze right on the single frame when he is looking elated and he has her in his arms and it's just this look of ecstasy. His life will never be more rewarding or more important or more valid than that second. Rocky never expected to win. Never. He knew it. He was that much of a realist. And I admired the character for that because so often I had gone to fight films and sporting films. Yes, we're gonna go out there, we're gonna knock him out, we're gonna win. We've come too far together to stop now. I said, no, I'm not gonna win. I'm going to get destroyed. But if I can just be elusive, if I can still be standing on my feet, you know what, then life isn't so bad. And I think, symbolically, at the very end of our lives, if we can still say, you know, we were never humbled, we were knocked down, but we got up, and I can say, I lived life with integrity, and I took all the blows, I still prevailed. That's what I tried to capture in this film. You stop this fight, I'll kill you. But more importantly, I also realized that you can't be alone. To really succeed, no man really is an island. And it took the love of a woman that no one else loved. You know, you're looking very great today, you know that? It took even the befriending of, of her brother who no one could understand. But they gelled together and, and Rocky brought this, this whole group together. They made a whole entity, a whole person. When you find the right components in your life, the right people that gel with you, then you feel as though you, you're invincible. It may be a fallacy, but you at least feel as though you can, you can take all that life has to dish out. And now when I sit back and I reflect on it, I truly miss that character so much. I tell you, sometimes I could just cry because I'll never have a voice like that again where I can just speak whatever I feel in my heart. And if I can go that distance, seeing that bell rings and I'm still standing, I want to know for the first time in my life that I weren't just another bum from the neighborhood. That's the one thing I'll always cherish about that character. If I say it, you won't believe it. But when Rocky said it, it was the truth.